Hello, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG. We are so glad you joined us today during this digital age. You could have tuned in anywhere else, but you chose PG, and we are incredibly grateful. Here's our pleasant planner for this week. Eternal God, our Father, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, let your perfect will be done in and through your people, Lord. Help us to be the salt and the light that you've called us to be in this sin sick and dying world. Lord, we thank you for being so very good to us. We thank you for your many seen and unseen blessings, for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. Lord, we thank you first and foremost for Jesus. We thank you for his precious blood, Lord, that washed our sins away as far as the east is from the west. Lord God, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is our comforter, and our guide and truth, Lord. And we pray that you'd help us, Lord, to surrender our will to the will of your Holy Spirit, to be guided by him, Lord, to be guided by your wisdom in all that we think, do, and say. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to worship and praise your holy name. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us, Lord, in our worship service. Be pleased with our worship, Lord. We thank you that uh, you've given us uh, one, Lord, who is dedicated himself to serve you, Lord, to study, to show himself approved, a workman, workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And now we pray, Lord, that you'd prepare our hearts to receive your word 
And we pray, Lord, that you would plant your word in our heart and that it would germinate and produce much precious fruit in our lives, Lord, that will redound to your praise and glory. Lord, we thank you uh, that we have this privilege to come before your throne to find grace to help in any time of need. And we ask your blessings upon all those that are sick among us, Lord. Uh, Lord, you know them, Lord. You know exactly where they are and what they stand in need of. We pray for their faith. We pray for their healing in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for all those who are bereaved, Lord. We pray for uh, certainly uh, still, Lord, the Clinton family, the Tucker family, Lord. We pray for uh, Kanye Nett Smith and her family, Lord. Lord, we pray for all those, again, who are sick. Uh, you know them again. Uh, the Armstrongs, Lord, the Stokeses, uh, Mother Hodges, Lord, uh, so many others, Lord. Uh, too many to name, Lord, but you know exactly where they are and, and the healing touch they stand in need of. Now, and Father, we thank you for uh, keeping us in your loving care, uh, even uh, through this pandemic, Lord. We thank you that we can have the peace that surpasses the understanding of this world as we trust in you, Lord, totally and completely in everything and for everything, Lord. And Lord, we pray for those who are on the front lines, Lord, uh, helping those uh, who are, have contracted this disease. We pray for their healing. We pray that you come for those who've lost loved ones to it. Lord, we pray for godly wisdom for all of our leaders, for our spiritual leaders, for our political leaders, Lord, for our judges, courts at every level, for the media moguls, Lord, and our corporate leaders, Lord, we pray for our country. And Lord, we pray that your will will be done. Let your redeemed say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Speak out for righteousness, Lord. And let, let the light, Lord, that you have given us so shine, Lord, that they would see you in us, Lord. We just thank you and praise you again, Lord, for this opportunity and this privilege to come before you and offer this petition. In Jesus' name, in his precious name, we pray. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and never pining till he appeared and the soul Oh, night, 
God bless you, brothers and sisters. I invite uh, you to go with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, the 35th chapter, and we will read verses 1 through 7a. Isaiah, the 35th chapter, and we will read verses 1 through 7a. And there you will find words similar to this. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are fearful, uh, of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance and with recompense, and he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For the wilderness shall waters break out and the streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become as a pool and the thirsty springs of water. Brothers and sisters, uh, we want to just pause for a moment of prayer before we go into the word of God. God, we thank you for this opportunity to share before uh, the pleasant parishioners and the body of Christ. God, we, pr we take this time seriously and we pray that uh, something is said that will cause uh, someone to want to lead a purposeful life. Uh, before you. Lord God, we pray that we continue to be an effective ministry uh, so that people will want to be saved through the ministry of Pleasant Green. God, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, let us all say collectively and virtually, Amen, 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 amen. Brothers and sisters, just for a moment or better, I want to use for a theme for today, the thrill of hope in a weary world. The thrill of hope in a weary world. Today's title is an excerpt from one of the most beloved Christmas songs ever composed. O Holy Night is a Christmas carol with an intriguing history. Its history begins in 1847 as it was composed by a wine commissioner who loved poetry, but a priest saw something in him and asked him to consider writing about Jesus. But on Christmas Eve, as the history of this song continues to unfold, in 1906, the hymn became the first song ever played across radio waves. Nevertheless, uh, when heard in America, it resounded with abolitionists as the song called for the chains of slavery to be broken, declaring that God's law 
is love and God's gospel is peace. This song finishes to say that in God's name all oppression shall cease. But before it ends, it declares a thrill of hope and a weary world rejoices. What a powerful statement to hear while living life under the brutal throes of slavery and gross injustice. What an inspiriting and inspiring narrative to consider while living a, in a dispirited world. Hearing such words encourages the distressed and exploited heart and gives hope to a disparaging environment. And might I suggest uh, to you uh, that in this uh, world of hopelessness, this is one of the reasons for Advent as it offers the thrill and the glimmer of hope in a world otherwise absorbed by darkness. There's a Vietnamese monk by the name of Thich Nhat Hanh who once says hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to bear if we believe that tomorrow will be better, we can bear the hardships of today. And brothers and sisters, I want to push further and say that one ounce of hope is worth more than a ton of despair because hope lights the path to deliverance. As we look at today's scripture, present circumstances of our text illustrates the dire and dismal circumstances of the day. The prophet Isaiah describes a drought. He describes a dry place. He describes the badlands and uh, uh, that they, brothers and sisters, they were in a place where they didn't have the essential resource of water. Sometimes in life, it just becomes exhausting and overwhelming as we find ourselves in that spiritual dry place. It gets overwhelming, my brothers and sisters, when we find ourselves in that place without the presence of God. The people in Judah and Isaiah 35 are in an unpleasant situation. They are in the dry place. They've lost their temple. They've lost their power and dominance. Everything that had given them a sense of direction and purpose at this juncture in history was gone. They were overwhelmed. They uh, were weary. They were lost. They were frustrated. They were afraid and they were feeling far from the presence of God. They were utterly despondent, but into their despair and into their confusion drops the word of God in Isaiah 35. And I want to pause before passing this particular point and say that sometimes we need to wait long enough for us to hear the word of God because the word of God is essential and the word of God is important when we find ourselves in dry places, when we find ourselves in bad lands, when we find ourselves in the place where we feel like we are far from God, it is important for us to hear the word of God. We read this particular passage. This passage is intended to be poetry 
in Isaiah 35 on this third Sunday of Advent, this Sunday of joy, after all uh, of the careful watching and the waiting, uh, we catch a glimmer or a thrill of hope and what might be possible when God breaks into human history. And I want to remind you that when God breaks into our affairs, God is known to transform our history. God is known to transform a loss into a victory. When God intervenes on our behalf, God can turn a dead end unto an open door. Why don't you ask Moses? God can turn a dead end unto an open door. When God mediates in our mess, ask Joseph. God can turn a prisoner into a prince. When God enters our activities, ask Paul. He can turn a misfit into a messenger. When God intercedes on our behalf, ask Zacchaeus. He can turn a scam artist into an alms giver. When God steps into our affairs, ask David. He can turn enemies and opponents into escalators and advocates. When God steps into our affairs, God can do some things that we had never thought of before. As we wait on Jesus to be born uh, in Bethlehem, uh, God retells the story of how God guided the people of God from one generation to the next generation. God guides the people of God in every generation. Therefore, as uh, re we reassess this particular text, there are a few Advent reflections that I want us to consider First of all, what I want you to consider, brothers and sisters, as we creep up on Christmas, first of all, God gives hope to the hopelessness. God gives hope to the hopeless, uh, and God gives hope even in situations of hopelessness. What the narrative suggests uh, is that all of creation and all of God's people are hearing uh, God. And once they heard God, they never gave up on the restoration that is promised to them in the future because they held on to the promises of God. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that I want to suggest to you that no matter what time period we are in, the word of God and the promises of God are still true. What the narrative suggests is that all of creation and all of the people of God were praising God again because they held on to the promises of God. And what is interesting to me in this text is that creation is rejoicing even in a state of devastation. What blesses me again is that creation has the faith, uh, all of creation has the trust and the resolve to remain ecstatic and expectant even in the face of affliction, anxiety, and inconvenience. And I think that is a point worth emphasizing before the body of Christ as we wait through this COVID season, as we reflect upon the catastrophes that have happened in this past year, all of the loved ones that we have lost, all of the jobs that have been put on furlough, brothers and sisters, what we must recognize is that all of these trials lend to our spiritual growth. 
whatever you have gone through in the year of 2020, what I want you to recognize that all of the trials, all of the hardships that you have faced, all of the things that you have gone through in 2020, they lend to your spiritual growth. They lend to your spiritual growth. A good way to assess the progress of that growth is that when you emerge at a place in your faith that you can with expectancy anticipate God's deliverance while you are yet in despair, brothers and sisters, that signals that you're growing in the Lord. And when you are confident about uh, what God will do and how God will intervene into our affairs and brothers and sisters with that hope, you can stand before the obstacles that you face in life. That's how you know that you are growing. You then know that your faith is strengthening when you are able to remain focused on God while being tossed and driven by the stormy seas of life. Because after all, what we must understand, smooth seas don't make skillful, skillful sailors. I, I want to say that once again, brothers and sisters, smooth seas don't make skillful sailors. But to be really uh, a master of the sea and to really master the sea, you've got to encounter some storms while staying focused and affixed and fastened to God. The seasoned saints would say it like this, hold to God's unchanging hand. The seasoned saints knew that there is hope in holding on to God's hand. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that you've got to know as a believer that there is hope in holding on to God's hands. And when you hold on to God's hands, you have hope that is in God's hands. And when you hold on to the hope that is in God's hand, God enables us to do things that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. When we hold on to the hope that is in God's hands, brothers and sisters, we can shout even though we have been laid off. We can praise God even though we are in the middle of a pandemic. We can give God glory in the midst of grieving when we hold on to the hope that is in God's hands. We can celebrate in solitude when we hold on to the hope that is in God's hands. It gives us a glimmer of hope so that we can raise up holy hands even when we are experiencing hell. When we hold on to God's hands, we expect deliverance even though we face dry places. And in our modern area, and in this modern era, excuse me, uh, this is an unfamiliar concept because most of our happiness is contingent upon the circumstances around us. Our happiness is contingent around, uh, upon the circumstances that are around us. We smile because we have an attractive spouse. We laugh because our bank account is fat. We're jovial because uh, the world, we have the world in a jug and the stopper in our hand. We, we are content because our children 
are successful. While these things are certainly something to be happy about, it is important for us to understand that these things that I just mentioned cannot produce joy. Henry Nouwen, theologian, once said in a compilation of his work entitled uh, His Word of Blessings, he says, joy is not the same as happiness. I want to say that again. Joy is not the same as happiness. We can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because joy comes from the knowledge of God's love for us. In other words, brothers and sisters, joy comes from knowing that God loves us. Joy comes from knowing that God embraces us. Joy comes from knowing that God has love for his children. Brothers and sisters, uh, when you know that God loves you, you have hope. And when you know that God will keep you, you have hope. The seasoned saints knew uh, what hope was because, brothers and sisters, they were able to still have joy even though they marched and fire hoses were turned on them, they were still able to sing because they had joy. And one of the things about joy, brothers and sisters, is that the world didn't give it to us. Joy is something that we have on the inside of us because we are connected to the love of God. Somebody said it like this, that this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world cannot take it away. God gives us this joy. One of the things I share with you, hope informs our joy. Hope fuels our joy. When we know that we have a God that will take care of us, brothers and sisters, it gives us hope with fuels our joy because hope enables us to see beyond our present circumstances. Another thing I share with you, brothers and sisters, is that God enables us in spite of our inabilities. First of all, God gives us uh, hope and God gives us joy, but also God enables us in spite of our in inabilities. I, I want to say that once again because there's someone who can shout to know that God enables us in spite of our inhabilities. What the text says uh, in verse, verses 3 and 4, what the text says, Isaiah calls for God to strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Isaiah asks God to tell those who have ancient hearts uh, or anxious hearts to be strong and not fear because your God will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come and save you. Here, Isaiah identifies our human frailties, but he recognizes God's ultimate capabilities. I, I want to say that again, brothers and sisters, because Isaiah was cognizant enough to recognize our shortcomings, but he recognizes also that God does not fail. He recognizes our restrictedness, but he emphasizes God's ceaselessness. When we recognize the fact that God's ultimate power supersedes our gross inadequacy, we are enabled to win even though we have a weak hand. Y'all gonna make me shout 
by myself. In other words, brothers and sisters, when you realize your weakness, when you realize your frailties, that gives you the inability to win even though you have a weak hand. I remember once playing a card game with my father. We were playing spades against two of our fraternity brothers and at the onset of the game, I noticed that I had a very weak hand. For those who uh, don't have any experience in playing cards, what I share with you is, brothers and sisters, a weak hand simply means that you don't have enough winning cards in your hand to win the game. And as we began uh, to order our hands of cards, I began to drop my head in disappointment because looking at my hand, the game was lost. In other words, brothers and sisters, if, if we were dependent upon what I had in my hand, the game was already lost. Somebody is about to miss their shout. But when I looked up to my father, I looked on his face and his face suggested that he had what it took to win the game. And, uh, and he had what it took to win the game despite my inadequacy and despite uh, the inadequacy of my hand. And while playing the game, I lost book after book after book. And I was depending on my hand. And as the game continued, I had exhausted all of my strategies. But when I laid down my last book that I thought I had, I looked at my father. And my father said, that's okay, son. I got this one. All I'm saying and all I'm trying to tell somebody today, brothers and sisters, that God is able to intervene even though you have a weak hand. Brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to share with you is that God will help you win even though you don't have what it takes to win. God, no matter how inadequate your hand is, God is able uh, to pick up your slack when you're weak and when you're falling. Brothers and sisters, he's able to do this because you're paired with the Father. And in spite of your inabilities, you will still win. That gives me hope. That gives me hope during this Advent season as we look with expectancy to, as Christ is about to show up in our lives. It gives me hope that when my hands are weak, his hands are strong. That's why uh, I will never forget this old nursery song uh, in a, a Sunday school. They, called, they taught us, they said, Jesus loves me. For this I know, for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong. We are weak, but God is strong. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, it says, God's grace is sufficient for me, and my power is made perfect in my weakness. I will boast gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. For Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults. I delight in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, that is when God is strong. That's why David says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. <clears throat> From whence cometh my help? All of my help comes from God. It is nothing that we can do within our own power, but God has the power to do anything. That leads me to my last point, brothers and sisters. Uh, God gives us hope. Uh, and brothers and sisters, not only does God give us hope, but God 
enables us in spite of our inabilities, but also the last thing that I share with you as you uh, enjoy the rest of your day, God overrides impossibilities. I'm encouraged today because God always overrides impossibilities. Whatever I feel like is impossible for me, God takes on the task and he makes it possible. Where am I? Let's look at the text. Isaiah 35 verses 5 through 7. Isaiah lists an inventory and he details a checklist of the impossibilities that God will override through the advent of Christ. This is something that shouts me. I don't even need to go further here. But when I look at the text, it shouts me. It shouts me because God overrides the impossibilities in our lives. He says that the blind eyes will be opened. Deaf ears will be unstopped because of the power of God. The lame men and women will leap like a deer because of the power of God. The voicelessness or those who have no voice, they'll be able to sing and preach uh, a new song. The springs of water will burst forth in the wilderness and in the desert. The streams will flow. Hot sands will become a cool oasis because of the power of God and the thirsty ground will yield a splashing fountain. This does not suppose that God is a genie in a bottle who grants wishes on demand. But brothers and sisters, what this does suggest is that God overcomes the impossible for us as long as the impossible is in the will of God. Brothers and sisters, I share this with you. God overrides the impossible in our lives. I'm reminded of a conversation that I had with a hospital building engineer. He was talking about backup generators. And one of the things, uh, we had a long conversation, uh, but the thing that uh, stuck with me is that he said that these generators detect when there is a cease in power. In other words, he says that these generators detect when you have no more power and when the generator and the power source that keeps the hospital running when it cuts off. Brothers and sisters, when there is no more power, the backup generator will step in and provide power where there was no power. What I'm trying to share with you today, that when your power goes off because of the nature, the majestic nature of God, God tends to operate when we are inoperable. Brothers and sisters, God provides a way where in your life it seemed like no way. God provides stability in the midst of instability. He's a rock in a weary land. Brothers and sisters, he's a way of escape. God is whatever we need, and God gives us hope for tomorrow. And because our hands are cleaned or cleansed or clenched to God's hands, we have hope for the next day. Brothers and sisters, he plants his footsteps way out on the sea, and we understand that God can do anything uh, that you cannot do if you have your hand in God's hands. Howard Thurman once said, God's most dramatic answer to death and destruction and human despair is the birth of a child, and that child's name 
is Jesus. One of the impossible things that he did also, brothers and sisters, there are a whole litany of characters in the Bible that God overrode their impossibility. But one of the things as we look forward to Christ's coming, we want to look forward to what, Christ, what God did in the life of Christ. God uh, showed up in the life of Christ when he was hanging to die on Calvary's cross. When Christ's power gave up, God's power kicked in. He died on one Friday. But one of the things that I want to celebrate with us as believers, that on one Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. The door of the church is open. The door of the church is open. Brothers and sisters, I pray, I pray, I pray that you have got something out of the worship service. I pray uh, that it has been invoking. I pray that it has been inspiring. And I pray that it has been encouraging. May God bless you until we meet again. It's time to worship through giving. Give online at pgmbcstl.org or mail in your tithes and offering at the address below. Hopefully the word was relevant and relatable. If you'd like to connect to Christ through our church, shoot us an email at ghpruitt at gmail.com. We are always excited to reaffirm our relationship with you. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram.